how to be a master, how to master anything. Welcome to Success Convo. I'm Ryan Ingle, and I am here with Kate Carlisle. We are going to discuss an awesome topic right now. It's how to master anything. Why would you want to master anything? What is a master? Let's first define a couple things. What does it mean to master something? What is your opinion of mastering something? To me, mastery means being an expert, being very good at something, having cultivated your skills, cultivated your abilities, and having other people look up to you as sort of the pinnacle of achievement in that field. Absolutely. So a recognizable person in that field, someone that has obviously done their homework enough to the point that they are booming in that field and probably most likely makes money at what they do. Mastery leads to money. It doesn't have to, but most of the time it leads to money or attention. If you have enough attention, you can certainly make money at what you're doing. So when I think of mastery, I think of somebody who is a famous singer. If you're an actor, you're a famous actor. You're at least in maybe C movies where you're being paid off of that. I would consider that a master, wouldn't you? Possibly. So basically, you know, any field that you're just dominating in and you're crushing in or a hobby. If you really have a hobby and you don't plan to make any money at it, but you're so good at it, you're a recognizable, distinguished expert in that field, whether it's say it's bow hunting, there might not be a lot of money to be made in bow hunting, but you know everything there is to know about bow hunting. Got it? Mm -hmm. Basically, there's a formula. The formula does not change for mastery. Part of the reason most people don't ever achieve mastery is because they disobey this formula. So this presentation was mine. I'm super pumped to do it. It's based on, it's loosely based on one of my favorite books. That's Mastery by Robert Greene. A very challenging read. So we're going to kind of streamline that in this presentation and kind of give you some actual usable, applicable things that you can start putting into your life right now if you want to take a skill to the next level, whether it's career goal, whether it's bodybuilding, whether it's even learning. So you can you can become a master at learning. And this formula absolutely works. So this will be a three-part presentation. First, I want to talk about why society has cranked out non-experts, why most people are not an expert. Why, why is that? Because the formula, after I lay this out for you, is not hard. It's, it's pretty simple and straightforward. Now, of course, it will be hard to achieve mastery, but people are just, they're disobeying the formula completely. So there's two key points on why people aren't masters. And I think one is our fault and one isn't. So let me explain the one that isn't. Our education system is not primed to create masters. It's actually primed to create what I'll call drones. It's primed to create people that don't think outside the box and that think very linear. So hear me out here. We grow up, we go through different classes. What do, what do we have going in school? Seven classes per day? Probably five to seven. Five to seven. Normally we find something that we like more than anything. I love science. But even in those classes, we're never drawn to learn what we love. We might find a topic that we love and then it's time to move because the curriculum has moved. So you have to move with your class. You never have enough time to explore your true passion. Instead, you get hit with waves of things you don't like, even in that field. And then that furthers itself through college. We have to get a ton of different credits that really don't mean much to us. And we're sitting in there studying the most crazy things that we really don't care about just to get through and pass a class all the while being kind of shunned away from what our true calling or passion is. So that's the first thing. I would agree with that. And part of the problem is beyond just the educational system, people are cultivated from a very early age to choose the safe course of action. To me, I think it's very difficult if you're going to choose the safe path to be truly successful. And there are some people, granted, who want to be a doctor, who want to be a lawyer and do very well for themselves in a, in a standard career. But for the most part, that's the way we're pushed by our parents, but also our teachers, anybody who's an influence when we're in our childhood is pushing us on the, the straight and narrow, the tried and true path. That's the safe path. It's not the risk-taking path. And as a result of that, the power and the ability to have exponential success is significantly reduced, and it's just not conducive to that. So we're taught and expected to sort of go go along the, straight, the path that everybody's followed, when really that's not the path that's going to lead you to be happy, and it's not the path that's going to lead you to be successful. Absolutely. 90% of people are stuck in there, probably higher, stuck in there just following that safe route. And when you talk about the safe route versus the risky path, now think about it. I said that we're getting kind of funneled through our classes and funneled through this, you know, we're, we're hoop jumping basically. We're credentialing our way to paperwork and making our parents happy, making everybody else happy because we're taking a secure path. But what's the other path? The other path is following that passion. 
Back to science. Let's say I really love science. Well, when that bell rang, what if I decided I'm staying in this class? If you want to kick me out, I'm staying in here to follow this specific thing that I want to learn. That could lead me to the path to mastery in that field. And that's what happens here. That This is the number two reason people do not become a master in their field. It's because they don't spend enough time on what they really love because they're forced down, which you know, Kate explained as the safe path. They don't follow their instincts. I would consider myself a master of a few things. Mm -hmm. One of which is advertising. I mean, how many advertising circles am I known in? Probably 10. Yeah. So, I mean, I would consider myself to be someone that has got that figured out to the point. Now, obviously this is a game that's always changing. The only reason I am a master at that is because I followed that night after night after night. I was always interested book after book after book, but this was a recent thing. This is a recent past five years. If I hadn't have followed that, I wouldn't be pulled in that direction, right? So I think it's it's twofold here. One, you have to recognize that the current system that we, we have in place, and that's the education system and even the financial system is it's completely broken. It's not going to let you discover mastery. Second piece of this is it's up to you to follow that. And you have to understand if you love something, whatever it is, you're going to be expected to do things that you don't like to do regarding that. But if you love it so much, you're cool with it. You're cool with the sleepless nights. You're cool with chasing it. Couldn't agree more. I think that's exactly what, right. What's something you've mastered? Writing. I think from a very young age, I loved reading. I can show you pictures, pull them out of my the picture books that I still have of me with just literally 10 stacks higher than me of books in my room. I loved reading and I, lo and I loved writing. I went to school. I was a journalism major. And that was actually something a lot of people go to college for something that they don't care about at all. But for me, it was something that I actually had a passion for, which is unique. I don't find that happens very much. But I love writing. And I would say I've certainly spent well over 10,000 hours mastering sentence structure, punctuation, word usage. And that's all things. I'm a total geek when it comes to writing. I just, I enjoy it a lot. It's because um, you obsess over it. Mm -hmm. Take mm -hmm. bodybuilding. I've been in gyms since I was in 10th grade, in and out of gyms, eating a certain way, you know, building my body to a point. And, and that's because I was obsessed with that. And I always have a, it, it's a very uh, transparent way to find out if you've got somebody who's going to be really good at fitness on their hands and really good bodybuilder per se. You go to the gym and you see them staring at themselves in the mirror, critically, you know, analyzing their physique in every way, shape and form. They're doing bicep curls, looking in the mirror. You know, this person is obsessing. This is a person who's probably going to be drawn to this. And you can see that within any field, just as Kate described, booklets of writing, booklets of writing. And that's, she's an incredible writer. I mean, you're get, you get contracts from all over the globe to analyze her stuff and then correct it and proof it, things like that, right? And that's because you obsessed over it so. Mm -hmm. Let's break down the formula. We get it. And, you know, Kate kind of alluded to something here. She said 10,000 hours. Let's hold on to that 10,000 hours. We'll come back to that because I want to I want to get through this part too first and then there's something really special that everybody needs to understand about 10,000 hours because there's certain myths about how long it takes to become an expert and I want to give you my take on it which I think is highly accurate and Kate may disagree because she doesn't know what I'm going to say here yet the formula let's discuss the formula it's a three-step formula to mastery you cannot disobey these when they're disobeyed it's very blatantly obvious. You have a business amateur. You have a fitness amateur. You have somebody who's not following these steps. The first one. Do you know what the first one is? Apprenticeship. Apprenticeship. Yep. So you have got to take on an apprenticeship. Now, this has been going on for centuries, yet people still disobey it, which it's kind of shocking to me. Apprenticeship means you're basically in a sponge form. You're going to learn. You're not going to act. You're not going to speak up. You're not going to, you know, put your, your two cents in. You're going to, I call it shut up and learn, where you're going to be taking in books, tons of texts, finding out what people that are already good at that skill are doing. Give me something, anything of success. Being a world famous cook. World famous cook. Great. A chef, right? I love to eat. You love to eat. <laughs> how would, how would you go about that? Chefs actually have a very you know similar apprenticeship program where they actually go in, if, the, if that's the goal they're seeking out for, they actually get brought in under a head chef and trained up, you know, in five-star restaurants and such. It's the head chef that's going to be cooking the fillets and cooking the specials. Mm -hmm. 
you're you're not going to go back into the kitchen and start throwing things together and think that you're going to become a chef that way, a head chef that way, a five-star chef. A five-star chef is actually a very good career position. These guys are bringing in well over 120000 a year. Did you know that? Mm-hmm. Head chefs are great. Oh, yeah. It's a great uh, position. A lot of high-end hotels, high-end restaurants, of course, carry the, this position. That head chef actually has a lot of other responsibilities. It's a unique business model. The starting out for that phase, you are going to be trying recipes. You're going to be looking into things or reading how different spices affect foods. You are not making any food for anybody, especially not at a five-star restaurant. So that was your goal to be a head chef. You know that you're not going to go straight back into the kitchen and start cooking stuff because your patrons would leave. The food would not be up to par. This is something that a lot of people have trouble with in my experience, particularly the older they get. And it's, it's unfortunate because I think it's a barrier to entry for a lot of people is when you're fresh out of college, you have you don't really have any bearing on anything yet. You don't have a career that you're set in. You're not sort of marching along. So it's it's very easy to go into something new. You you're at liberty to to try new things. If you're in your 30s, your 40s, you have an established career, maybe you have a family to support, a lot of people feel like they can't take that jump and start something new and it's a point of pride for them to go in and be low man on the totem pole and try to have have to do sort of some of the scut work essentially that they would never expect to be doing at that age or that stage in their career and for for a lot of people you have to put your pride in the back seat and realize be humble about it and accept that there's a lot you don't know if you're going into a new area and that's part and parcel of taking that jump and doing something that you really want to do they is knowing that you're go going to through, have to start on the ground floor and work your way up. They have to go through the apprenticeship, and they don't. Mm-hmm. You're absolutely right. And this is why there's a lot of shakeups, like especially in Silicon Valley, with a lot of the older employees getting basically slammed now by the rookie coders, right? If you are built on a foundation that never had an apprenticeship, there's a lot of things wrong with what you're doing, okay? Most likely, unless you pave the way in a field, you are going to have to do your apprenticeship. Now, it's very blatantly obvious when someone doesn't. Look at fitness. They never learn or read about anything. They go to the gym for years. And like you said, they get kind of stuck in their old ways. And then it's like too late at that point because they're never going to be humble enough to be like, well, I've been doing this wrong all along. Wow. I need to change it up. Learn. Now, this goes back to one of the biggest business tips, really life tips of all time. Measure twice, cut once. Take the time to learn about what you're doing before you go in there bullheaded with it. Can I throw out a suggestion here? Yeah. Because I think this is probably the point where a lot of people are getting scared because they're thinking to themselves, well, wait a second, where do I find somebody to learn from? I want to be an online businessman. I want to have a, an online coaching company. How do I find somebody that I can, I can't just stand behind somebody and email somebody and say, hey, can I stand behind you for the day and watch what you're doing on your computer? So what do I do? And I want to offer kind of a silly example here. Remember Mrs. Doubtfire? Yeah. Remember when the lead character needed to put on a good front and be the, you know, the domesticated Lead character? Housewife? That's Robin Williams. I, Call him Robin Williams. Well, yeah, Williams. but he wasn't Robin Williams in the movie. <laughs> Bullshit. Well, but so he needed to learn how to cook, right? Uh-huh. And so what did he do? He turned on the, the cooking channel, the Food Network, and watched episode after episode, taking notes, learning from other people. That's a brilliant analogy. And so I feel like people need to be willing to do that. If they can't exactly. find somebody in real life, go online. TV is sort of obsolete to learn from at this point, but yeah. read, a, pick up a book, go online, watch YouTube videos. Here's There's ways to do it without being there in person. I'm so glad you brought this up. Social intelligence. If you don't have it, you're in trouble. You do not roll into an apprenticeship. And this is one of the bigger things that that happens in an apprenticeship. Someone doesn't put their time in for apprenticeship, and then they go out there talking to a master and say, hey, I'm just going to take what you're learning, or I'm just going to... They disrespect the master because they have no social intelligence. They get nowhere. They get stonewalled every path they go, and they're stonewalling themselves in their brain. They're doing more damage because they're not actually open to learning. They want to insert themselves, and they think that they're entitled, that we could go into entitlement i think we need to do a full podcast on, I agree. on entitlement because it's it's a plague right and that's how you, that's the quickest path to nowhere is getting you know you're not humble and you get entitled so you're in your apprenticeship phase and you start speaking up and you know interjecting your ideas you step to, to phase three of this okay so it's apprenticeship I'm very glad that you brought that up real quick remedy for that social intelligence what book would you grab isn't there a book emotional intelligence 2.0 didn't you read that one recently? EQ 2.0 is very good. But I was thinking of something more like a throwback that just covers all the bases. And that's How to Win Friends and Influence People Ooh, by Carnegie. that's a good one. If you grab that, you're not going to make those mistakes. By the way, if you are listening to this, promise you, you're going to want to go ahead to Amazon, wherever, download that book. 
get the paperback, whatever it takes. I have it on my desk. It's highlighted. It is a very, very good book. So Throw move- something out there too, because I got this question the other day from somebody about what if you don't have time to read? One good thing to do, I, I actually did this quite a bit when I used to have a really long commute, is get a, get an audiobook. It's a great time there it is. To, to get in your what you would otherwise be reading, but you Especially still get the if content. You and- if you haven't read in a while, it's definitely going to be a good way to coast into mm-hmm. picking up bigger I text. mean, it's better than listening to what the comedy channel or some music that you might listen to on your way in. Exactly. You'll be getting much more quality out of out of your listening. Exactly. Unless it's Friday or something and you just got to jam out. I got you. It's <laughs> fair. So let's move on to number two. This is the formula. First is apprenticeship. Number two, skill building. This is the hard part, the sucky part. This is where you have to actually build skills in that area. So chef, you gave me chef. You probably have to taste test a lot of things that aren't going to be good. You probably have to spend a lot of hours in the kitchen crafting and getting these recipes figured out, just the baseline ones. You, you probably have, you know, you want to move on to those great recipes. You want to be able to make that beautiful filet and swordfish, you know, perfectly shaped on the plate and everything. But you can't at this point. When you're in the grind, this is, this is where business people talk about the hustle and the grind. This is phase two. This is where you're getting those skills and cultivating those skills. So you can see what an essential piece of you this is. Right? This is where you're actually learning. Take it and put it into fitness, one of my favorite categories. This is the part where you are actually taking your knowledge and going and trying these workouts, but you're putting in the workouts in a way that you're actually trying to learn from them. You might need to carry a training diary around at this point. You want to take notes. You want to do the things that kind of suck in that field. Give me an example of skill building. Well, I want to say something about social intelligence. We talked about this a little earlier, but mm-hmm. I that's a, an important skill and one that often gets lost in the mix. One thing I want to throw in here, it's an important skill to cultivate, but it often gets backburnered because it's not a hard concrete skill. It's sort of soft and squishy is emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence is really the the dictionary definition of it is the ability to form rewarding relationships with other people. Hmm. But there's not a successful entrepreneur, a successful businessman, whatever. Or a chef. Or or a a chef chef who doesn't have the ability to read people and to understand, put themselves in somebody else's shoes and really understand their experience from their perspective. And this is key for so many reasons, being able to really empathize with somebody and anticipate their moves, anticipate what they want. A good example of this is say you wanted to be a chess champion. There's not a single person in this world who's very good at chess, but doesn't have the ability to read the other person with precision and know exactly what they're going to do next and predict their every move. And that's a huge part of emotional intelligence is being able to really understand somebody that you don't know very well. That's a very good point. And I mean, you you pretty much just landed that and laid it out. That's like a basic building block of something that you're going to need to be successful in any field because you rub the wrong person the wrong way and you're gone. Social intelligence also catch you in a jam because if you think you got a hot product or something and you go throw down 20 G's to advertise it per se, you're going to get smoked. If you had social intelligence, you probably could have recruited some people to, you know, give you a a little bit of a, a review on that first, critique it for you. But if you have no tact or no social skills, you're not going to get anywhere. Some other skills, for example, um, a lot of the advertisements that you see, there's a lot of graphic design that goes into that. Do you think I just popped up graphic design? Remember all the hell I went through learning graphic oh, design yeah. over the years? I've taught myself graphic design, but I've taught myself using apprenticeships. I've watched so many YouTube videos. Think about it. Would it be easier for me to watch a YouTube video for two hours on how to actually build out something that I want and learn fades and everything in Photoshop or to learn it myself, just go straight into skill building? That would have been horrible. So I watch the videos, then I go back over and practice, practice, practice. I mean, I think when it comes down to skill building, this is it practice and keep in mind that with all these three so with this formula you're constantly doing all of them okay I haven't revealed the third one yet but you are constantly uh, you know you're in your apprenticeship phase forever you've got to stay humble with whatever you're doing and then you're always skill building now let's jump into number three number three is adding uniqueness this is where you put your spin and your flair on it you're not just going to watch someone that you would call a mentor and then learn what they're doing and take everything they're doing and then you know get the skills that they got and then create the product the exact same way no it doesn't work that way now you get the fun part okay this is the best part You want to add your own spice, your own flavor, your own flair. What makes you unique? 
Okay, so Arnold Schwarzenegger has a really cool phrase. He said that you have to learn the rules first, then you have to break them. Breaking the rules. I like that. Yeah, breaking the rules with creativity. It's one of his rules for success. Breaking those rules with creativity is the fun part. This is where you have trial and error. And, you know, it can get to you. It can definitely get to you because your your own uniqueness might not always win in the market. The market's a fair place. It'll tell you what wins or loses. But it might not always win. And it can be hard to realize that something that you loved and you tried to present to people, whether that's art, whether it's a song, you're a singer, and you made that song nobody likes, at least you followed the structure, you'll be able to get back up much easier. I agree with that, although in true Robert Greene fashion, because Robert Greene does this in some of his books where he has the reverse or the converse, where there's a sort of an opposite to the point, Mm -hmm. sometimes people run into a trap where they have a great business model and it's like nothing else out there. It's in, it's in an industry that's saturated, like let's take fitness, where they have a great idea for how to deliver a product, but it doesn't exist. And sometimes there may be a reason it doesn't exist. So if you're just starting out, one of the best things you could do is study what works, study the businesses that are doing well and how they're delivering the product, how they're framing their product, the language they're using, what's persuasive to people. That's at least at the beginning, you're going to get a jumping off point from using things that are determined already to work. You'll have plenty of time to build in and get creative later, but starting off with something that you know is proven is often a much more fruitful way to get started um, than, than going with something that's totally unknown. Now, sometimes you're creating the market. You invent a product that literally doesn't exist, mm-hmm. and so you're setting the price point. You're, you're creating the awareness of the product in people's minds. There's no model to go off of, and that's really the only example I can think of where you can start fresh with not even worrying about what else exists and what else is out there because there is nothing. But otherwise, looking at something else that's work workable and successful is generally a good approach. It's very good to have a control. We're talking about basically having a control, something that already works that you can work off of mm-hmm. because there's a really good saying, you can always spot the pioneer. He's got arrows in his back. Right? If, you, if you don't want to face those arrows in your back and you don't want to face those pains, Try to see the mistakes somebody else did before before you make it. Because being a trailblazer, though, it you can hit a home run. You can hit a grand slam as being a trailblazer. You can get to big money quick, and you can land investors quick and everything like that with an invention. But like Kate said, you really want to survey that land first. You don't want to get caught up in the excitement of an idea. I think I think some rookie startups and business owners always fall victim to that at least once. Or you get kind of bitten with your own imagination, your own idea, and you think, wow, I've got a t-shirt idea. This is the best t-shirt idea I've ever thought of. And, you know, it's an idea, right? That idea can kill you because then you go and put money into it. And you you get a warehouse full of this t-shirt, let's say. Or you put some money down behind marketing that t-shirt. Only to fall face first to realize, oh, wow, I was the only one that thought this was cool. You know, because if you don't take your uniqueness and then kind of whittle that down into something workable, absolutely, you're going to get burnt. But you can't go wrong following that three-step process. Apprenticeship first, skill building second, and then adding your uniqueness. How long do you think you should spend on each one of these? Oof, that's a tough one. Apprenticeship, I think, probably the longest because that's where you're soaking up knowledge. You're in sponge mode at that point. So I would say probably six to nine months in apprenticeship. Yeah, that's and actually really good. Uh, is that spot on? That, that's, it's, I wouldn't say it's spot on. But that's very accurate. So we talked about 10,000 hours because we could speculate. We could actually speculate over how long you should spend in each one. But I think it's going to come down person to person. Would you agree? And it's also going to come down to what niche you're talking about. For example, you know, it could take a chef. I think there's a five-year period to become a master chef. Well, and it also depends where you're coming from, right? So if you're going from being, let's take the doctor example again. If you're Mm -hmm. a doctor and you want to go be a realtor, very different skill set, very different parts of your brain you're using. Some of those things may not readily translate. And so you really are taking a completely different, it's black and white at that point in terms of the leap you're making and the transition you're making. But if you're a journalist and you want to be a fiction writer, probably not that big of a leap. And you're going to have to cultivate some new skills and still go through some, many of these steps. But one it's not going to be as it. abrupt of a transition. And so it might not take you as long as it otherwise might. And one way you can do it is by looking at the competition in that field. Mm-hmm. You can absolutely size up the competition in that field. I mean, to get to become one of the best defense attorneys, you are going down a very hard path. You're looking at 20, 30 years, right, to get to that level. That's actually one of the few professions, that and medicine, where age makes you more competitive. Mm -hmm. These days with the tech industry, the younger you are, the more competitive you are. Totally different, exactly. But totally different if you're a doctor and attorney. That's why you can't really say exactly how long it will take. But So there's this this, uh, 
myth of 10,000 hours. I'm calling it a myth. I want to know if you think it's true. Do you need 10,000 hours, which translates into what, 10 years? Well, if you figure there's, you'd have about, if you spent literally no time, no time sleeping, no time eating, no time doing anything, you'd have about 8,000 plus hours in a year. So if you did nothing else, you'd still fall short of the 10,000 hours in a year. You'd need about, say you have 12 hours in a day to dedicate. Well, it depends because you want to be doing other things. But if you literally did nothing, let's say you have 12 hours a day that you dedicate to your new craft, your new passion, you would need about two and a half years to hit that 10,000 minimum. Yeah. Okay. So Kate, I asked Kate one time, what is the best skill? This was a day where I was having a real bad day. Uh, took some business losses. What, what went wrong that day? What didn't go I wrong didn't, that day? I think I didn't get a business sale or I almost had a deal locked in. It was going to net me 20,000 and then it fell through. Well, you had a deal that you walked head. out thinking you had, you had it in the bag. And exactly. They decided it was a $20,000 contract and then they got cold feet due to legal. I remember that. So I'm having a very bad day and I asked Kate, something. I'll never forget this. It was raining. I said, what is the most important skill to have? Most powerful skill that you can have. Remember what you said? The ability to learn quick. Exactly. The ability to learn quick. This is the market that we're in. This is the current times. We all have an iPhone. Well, most of us do. Some of us have droids. But either way, we've got the internet in our pocket. (laughs) Right? But we've got the internet in our pocket. Okay? We have the internet in our pocket. We have computers. How quick can you learn? If I'm looking at a sign, I went to the gold gym the other day and uh, actually standing out there, I made this analogy with a buddy. And I looked up at the sign. I said, see that sign? He asked me the same thing. He said, what do you think is a good skill to develop? And I said, well, I'll tell you what the most you know, important skill is. It's the ability to learn fast. He said, what do you mean? I said, look at that sign. So you can picture the luminescent gold gym sign. I said, how was that created? If it was you versus me right now, who's going to find out how that was created first? Literally, the design of it, how the light works, everything to know about that sign. We each get 10 minutes and then we have to present how that sign was created which one of us can devour the information and learn first to learn learn the best and then present it better right so the ability to learn quick is the most important thing you can have i think that you can eliminate 10,000 hours by picking up the skill of learning quick how do you cultivate that you skill? cultivate the skill of learning quick by giving yourself practice tests just like i did with the light I went in my car and I found out how to make that light. I found out how it works, okay? What do I do? What am I practicing there? What re- what sites do I go to? What research path do I take? Does outlining work? Because we're all different. And I found out for me that I take in the information by reading it as quickly as possible with having a handwritten outline next to it. I write my points down. I'm absorbing that information way quicker. Most people don't have any concept or idea of how they learn. They're, they never thought about that. They never took the time to actually realize that and map that out. And that goes back to elementary school. We're all, we're all taught in the same way, sort of a cookie cutter model. There's no attention to the fact that our brains work differently. Our thought processes work differently. So that's- and if you try to do something differently, they're going to come down and scold you. In college, I always brought a paper into my class. I brought the Wall Street Journal, and I would read that in class. My mind has some weird split focus thing where if I'm occupied by something else, maybe 20%, I can actually get someone speaking. I can, and it was a professor, for example, that was talking a lot, right? He had no visuals. I took that information in much more. But I was always told to put the paper away. To one time I got an argument and stated my case that I'm learning this way, man. Right? And he let me go because, I mean, I'm paying the bills to go to college. But the point is we are scolded for trying new things. We all work differently. Some of us are visual learners. Some of us are audible learners learners some of us put two and two together and learn better i know some people that actually this is a good tip if they want to read a book they want to consume the knowledge of a book because when we're talking about reading what are we talking about we're not actually talking about sitting here reading you know 50 shades of gray or some shit like that we're reading business books where we need this information because it's going to better us i only read nonfiction, and that's me nothing against anybody that that reads fiction books for entertainment or whether they want to reverse engineer stories but i read the books because i need that information so how do i get in my head a buddy of mine he actually takes the book speeds the audio up he he gets the audio version and the paperback speeds the audio up times two 
and reads along with his eyes and speed reads. Mm, and that information like that. gets absorbed in there because we're trying to do absorb it. So you need to learn what makes you learn faster. Once you get that, personally, I don't think you need 10,000 hours. And here's another thing to think about. This is a nice breath of fresh air for you. If you're like, look, I want to get into a career path or I want to be, you know, I want to be ripped as hell. I want to learn fitness. I want to master fitness, for example, right? And you're thinking, well, man, 10,000 hours. I don't have five to 10 years in, you know, to throw at that and have a social life and do everything else. So I'm never going to be able to get there. Well, the number 10,000 hours, and I don't think you know this, Kate, but that's actually based on pure experts in a field. Do you need to be a pure expert in a field nowadays to make a living at it? To, no. To in fact, find some of the most in. successful businessmen know a little bit about a lot of things, but not a whole ton about any one thing. So the number 10,000 is a myth. It's, it's, I think that a lot of amateurs hear that number and it scares them away when that's not the truth. The truth is learn as fast as possible and then follow the three steps, follow the formula and kick out a product, right? I mean, we just, we live in a time where things are so much more available to us. And that number 10,000 emerged in a time where we did not have the internet and they were basing things off experts. Now you can be known and not be a full on expert or master. I'm not known by ABC or MSNBC as an advertiser, but I'm known in my circles as an advertiser. I drive a lot of money as an advertiser and have a lot of high end business clients as, as an advertiser. But does that mean I'm some king advertiser? No, you know, I'm not doing advertisements for these super big cats, but I'm doing well. And this is why, because the time we live in is different. So that should give you a lot of comfortability to take on that new task. But like Kate said, if you're going to take on that new task, be humble, do your apprenticeship. doesn't matter what age you're at. I couldn't agree more. You're absolutely right. And for that matter, taking on new things and, you know, being humble and taking on new apprenticeships, that's the key to the fountain of youth right there. That'll keep you young. That'll keep you excited. That'll keep you happy in your life. No doubt. So that's part two, and that's the formula. Now that we have the formula, I want to talk about the most important thought process for our master, the most important mindset to mastering anything. And then I can't wait to get to my big takeaway. My big takeaway is a real game changer in this one. Three mindsets. This is also according to Robert Greene, but this is highly accurate. The first one, the original mind. I love the original mind. I think I'm, <laughs> I have it all the time. The original mind is the mind we have as a child where we see things from our imagination. There's nothing too big and bold for us. And when we're growing up, think about the things we want to be and do. Right? Little kids, they want everything. They watch their favorite action hero on a cartoon and they think they can actually become an action you hero. You know what I wanted to be when I was about four? What's that? A librarian and a scuba diver. <laughs> You kind of in a way did it. <laughs> True story. So yeah, we have these crazy thought processes. You know, there's no limit to a child's mind. But then what happens as we age? We get the conventional mind. And this is also forced upon us from society where we're told, no, that's too big and too bold. What's a reachable goal that a child might have? Famous actress. All right, let's take a famous actress or actor for that matter. I kind of wanted to do that as a kid. I loved watching these movies. I wanted to be the next Arnold. So here we go. It's a good one. I wanted to be the next Arnold Schwarzenegger. Famous actor, you know, 80s movie star, you know, or, or how about Rocky Balboa, Sylvester Stallone, right? He's one of my heroes too. I wanted to be this. But as I grew older, society told me, my parents, and like you said earlier, the secure route, you're never going to go to Hollywood. You're never going to be a famous actor. You would have had to be born in LA. You would have had to do all these things. Not knowing that Arnold was actually born in Austria and basically fought tooth and nail. Man did everything. His story is amazing, by the way. You've read Total Recall? I skimmed it? it. Okay, so basically Arnold's story is just one of the most motivating on this planet, if not the most motivating, but he came from completely nothing and chased it. The point is, we get a conventional mindset, one that tells us, oh no, you have to learn equations, you have to learn advanced algebra, and then you have to be a good little boy or girl. Your dreams really start getting stomped out around your teens. They try to put you in this track and you stop exploring that original mind. You stop having these big fantasies. Even though a lot of the big fantasies are something that someone else has done, a billionaire for that matter. Do billionaires exist? There's roughly 500 in the world. So absolutely billionaires exist. Why couldn't I be one? Well, our parents would never have us believe that we could achieve that. So we're scaled down. We're scaled down for our own safety. 
taking the secure route, you know, because most people can't match to match this mastery. We've talked about that in some previous podcasts with how to make money. So the conventional mind, right? So to recap, you know, you've got the original mind that you have as a child where there's no limitations. Then the conventional mind where there's a lot of limitations. You can no longer be that famous singer, famous actor, actress. You're never going to be a millionaire. You need to get your good job and then, you know, invest your money in only the company stocks, everything like that, right? That's the conventional thought process. It's really about how your mind processes information too. We're taught to think about the world and see the world in a very linear way. You mentioned this before where we, we, we take in information and we regurgitate it in familiar forms. So we have standardized tests. We have the LSAT. We have the SAT. We have all these different ways to measure aptitude, but they're based on very linear ways of thinking. And we're not taught, when's the last time you saw a test that asks you to write a short story? It never happens. It would be a great way to assess how your mind processes in processes information, but it never happens because we're just not taught to think that way. And part of the reason as a kid that we're so willing to be creative and build cool stuff with Legos and make cool things out of Play-Doh and we have that very creative element is we haven't been met with failure yet. We haven't been mm. met with rejection yet. We haven't, the world hasn't beaten us exactly, down. And yep. so we still have that element of being creative and dynamic. And as you get older, you have to fight to preserve that. Absolutely. You have to train your mind to preserve that. So you got the original mind, you got the conventional mind. There's a, there's a most powerful mind that almost every entrepreneur possesses. I have it. You have it. The dimensional mind. It's a mixture of the two. Somewhere in the middle. It's creativity and skill. You've got the conventional skill, so you've cultivated things. You've done a lot of boring things, a lot of reading. You've learned how to you know, make the most out of your tax money, get the most back. You've learned how to make money, all the things that adults should know. But then you're not too afraid to dream. You're, not, you're humble enough to continue to learn, but then you're ready to take risks. Here's a good example. What does a teacher say? The 60-year-old teacher where would you like to teach, good sir? What would your dream teaching be? He says with a conventional mind, well, I would love to teach in a Yale classroom. That would be amazing. That's what his mind can produce, right? So he wants to teach in Yale to 30 students. Wow, professor. And then the little child might say back to him, well, I want to teach the whole world. And that professor says, well, <laughs> that's a silly little boy thought process. I want to teach in Yale. You can't teach the whole world, you dumb kid. Well, the dimensional thinker steps up and says, well, hang on. What about YouTube? What if I develop a lesson plan so good that the students of a Yale classroom would just gobble up this knowledge and I teach it on my platform to YouTube and then I learn advertising, marketing to promote myself. Now that's where the dimensional, world-shaking mind comes in. And the dimensional thought process can be found everywhere. This is where the real big boys play. I think that's spot on. Now the dimensional mind, there's some issues to cultivate that. What has to happen? You've got to get beat down by the world so much and beat down by all the things that, that Kate mentioned, you know, failure, and you've got to keep it because it can be very hard to hold on to. Kate and I have this uh, funny little story that we tell, right? There is not one woman that I will not approach. I will approach any woman and I will get rejected time after time. You don't get rejected. <laughs> That's not true. I get beat. I get rejected all the time, right? People don't, people don't really dig the blonde hair. They're not really feeling something, right? But that does not stop me from going back in. I really think that my failure module has gone. I think my failure module broke at some point, and I'm just <laughs> stupid at that point to keep going. One of my favorite quotes, before we jump into the big takeaway, one of my favorite quotes by Steve Jobs, he said that to be successful as an entrepreneur, you have to actually be crazy. You have to be insane because you continue to go back. As much as it hurts, you go back. And there's nothing that hurts more emotionally than putting your projects on the line and getting slammed by the market and it doesn't accept it. People don't like it. You know, that is hard. So you have to be a little insane. I absolutely agree. I cannot wait to hear this big takeaway. Let's get to it. Big takeaway for being a master. Okay, okay. I love this big takeaway. I've, I've thought about this big takeaway and I cannot wait to reveal this. Let me get into it. And then your, your big takeaway is coming right up. So I can't wait to hear yours. All right. You want the fastest path. You want the best path to results. You want to get through something quick. You ever been to a bowling alley? Duck pins, let's say. Oh, of course. Okay, so... We we see at duck pins they have the lane guards that come up for the real little kids. You oh yeah, my brother at every single his birthday's in December. He went to the bowling alley every year. Okay, so you know I'm talking about the lane guards. It's a real cheap play where you know you get the five year old the lane guards pop up and uh -huh. the ball can't hit the gutter. 
Wouldn't you like lane guards in a business profession, in a fitness plan, in you know anything you're chasing down? What if I told you you could have lane guards while well, you're definitely going to get to the end? Wouldn't you jump on that? So it's going to get me there quicker? It will get you there quicker. It will get you to mastery, mastering something quicker. I'm in. Okay, here's the deal. Get a mentor. Get a mentor. It seems simple, right? But why do people not do it? They don't go out and recruit a mentor. We can search things. We can find a person. And when I say the lane guards, you know, actually having something there to help you with your failure, because even with the lane guards there, you can, you can fail. It can let's, let's say for this example, it can break past the lane guards, but it's very hard to do, okay? If you've got a mentor, somebody who's been in your path, could you imagine doing a bodybuilding show without a coach? No. It's something it's unheard of. Could you imagine, and I couldn't imagine going into a new business venture without finding out who the best in that field was and then sending them an email. You know what sits behind me in my office? It's a yeah. letter from somebody. Who's the letter from? Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett has sent me a letter. Why am I special? This is the second richest man in the world, and he sent me a letter. I reached out to Warren Buffett when I first began to trade stocks. One of the first stock shares I ever bought was Berkshire. That was his. I reached out to him and told him what an awesome mentor he had already been to me, and if I could just get in the door with him. You know, I laid everything out to be humble in front of a, a billionaire, right? But this is a man who has so much going on, yet he took the time to reach back out to me and we've been in contact. Think about that. You can find your mentor. If you can't get Warren Buffett, you know, which might be unlikely, it might be hard to do, you can certainly get somebody who's doing well in that cra- in that field to, you know, merge yourself with. Who was one of your legal mentors when you're coming up in the lawyer field? When I was in law school, I remember going to meet with, I went to law school in Boston, and so there were a, a bunch of high-end firms in town, and I remember there were three or four partners that I reached out to and said, hey, can we grab coffee? Can I can I pick your brain on a couple of things? And what they told and me was instrumental the coffee. to... I did. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's customary. You have to bow down to these mentors, but they, they gave you some good hints. They did. They did. And it was instrumental to the path I ended up taking. Absolutely. And if a mentor, you know, I, I buy, I buy so many marketing products from people that were doing better than me. Um, I've since passed half of them and nothing against them, you know, and shit. I mean, I still learn so much from them, but it's like, you have to work with people. You have to find people that are better than you and hope to goodness that you have the social intelligence to rein them in and get their attention and work with them. I love it. That's That's my big takeaway. It's it's grabbing a mentor. I just, I think it's overlooked all the time. And I think our worst mentors, the ones that were given automatically, were given teachers, were given, I mean, you could find good teachers. Don't get me wrong. I'm not bashing teachers or anything because there's a lot of great teachers that I've had in my life that I'm proud to call my mentors. But the people that we're forced to be around, our families, for example, those are big influences influences on us and they're mentors to us. Think about it. Are they, should they really be mentors to us? Are they at a place of success in the field that we want to be in? Most of the time, no, not at all. I like it. That was a great takeaway. Let me hear yours. All right. You might disagree with this one. I call this the relevance factor. And the, the point of the relevance factor is that we have a limited time. We talk about 10,000 hours, 1,000 hours, whatever the amount I'm of time it takes one. for you to be a master. It takes time, right? We can agree on that. So one of the things that's super important, particularly if you have a life right now where you've got a career, you've got kids, you've got obligations, you may have a limited amount of free time to dedicate to whatever it is you want to actually be doing and what you want to become a master in. I want you to take a minute. And when you have a movie that you want to go to, a dinner function you want to attend, anything that you want to do in that little amount of free time that you have, rate it on a relevance scale. One to ten. One being this has no relevance to what I want to be a master in. Ten being this is directly correlated to what I want to be a master in. And if it's not a five or above, really think hard about whether it's something that you should be spending your time on because it's not going to help you get where you want to be. You kill it with a list. That's damn good. (laughs) You like it? That's, That's badass. I love it. I know it's a little aggressive for some people because they, and don't get me wrong, you need that time to, you know, do things that are mindless and will relax you. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm all for that. But by and large, you should be doing things that are five and above on the relevant scale. Yeah. You just killed it with that. You knocked it out of the water. I love that. Absolutely. Is that what, I saw you writing that before. I've seen your relevant scale before. Yeah. I, I usually I do it in my head, but sometimes I do it on paper. Badass.
I love that. So I hope you enjoyed this episode of Success Convo, one of my favorites. And again, this is coming from some Robert Greene texts. If you haven't heard of him, definitely pick up his books or at least give him a look. I love mastery. Robert Greene is definitely on point. Some great stuff. All right. I really enjoyed this conversation, Kate. Thank you for having it with me. Absolutely. And everyone else, thank you so much for listening. Again, it seems like Success Convo just grows. And that's just exactly what we wanted. We love the discussion. We love all the feedbacks, the emails that have been flooding in about Success convo so we are super pumped to keep this rocking new episode every week and we will catch you on next week's episode of success convo